Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast. I'm your host, Christian Harris, and my guest today is Graham Ford. Graham is an architect and he's worked on some very high profile buildings, as he'll tell us uh, in the interview. And I wanted to get him on because something I've uh, often thought is that, you know, we need to be designing buildings with safety in mind, as well as operating them with safety in mind. So I wanted to pick uh, Graham's mind a little bit about that. Uh, we delve into some of his principles around design, which is really interesting. Uh, we talk a bit about maintenance of buildings and upkeep and how you need to be really ahead of the curve in terms of how you design these buildings with maintenance and the lifespan of the building uh, in mind. Um, we talk about trends in safety when it comes to design and how that has shifted over the years, uh, as well as touching on fire, which obviously is quite a big uh, topic, which is uh, current at the moment. And the other very current topic we talk about is ventilation. So, you know, we're, we're all uh, much more interested in how well our buildings are ventilated now than we ever were uh, before uh, 2020. So I uh, hope you enjoy this. I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, if you do, as always, we'd really appreciate uh, if you hit subscribe, uh, if you give us a review and please pass the word on to any uh, friends or colleagues that might be interested in uh, learning about the show. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that feedback continues to be great from, from you, the audience, and the numbers of, uh, of listeners in the audience continues to grow as well. So all signs are pointing in the right direction. And I uh, hope you enjoy this episode with Graham Ford. Cheers. Graham Ford, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good of you to give up some time of an evening. That's fine. Uh, well, happy to be here. It's uh, always always fun to talk about how to build and design and maintain buildings, I suppose. Yeah, no, that's right. And um, I'm looking forward to having a chat about um, design and safety and, and uh, everything in between. Perfect. Would you want to start by giving us a bit of um, background, Graham, in terms of, you know, uh, who you are, where, you know, your career and kind of where you are now with, with your uh, practice? Yeah, so I, um, uh, I'm a New Zealand architect. I, I, I came to the UK in 2002 um, and I worked um, on a number of buildings. Um, the main project uh, I, I started on here was the Roundhouse Theatre in Camden Town. So I was part of the team that designed and built that. Um, some of you will know the Roundhouse Theatre. It was a famous venue for uh, rock stars back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, Pink Floyd and um, all sorts of people performed there. So uh, that was my first big project that I built in the UK. And um, following, following uh, the, when, when I completed that in, a, in about 2006, I set up my own practice. Mm -hmm. so from 2006 through to now, I've run my own practice. Um, in 2008, uh, things changed a bit with the global recession yeah. and I um, I started doing consultancy on um, the Olympic Games um, and sort of bigger much bigger projects so what I did is I consulted to contractors and architects um, and uh, on design and build projects mm -hmm. and provided sort of services um, on much bigger scale projects so we did a city in the Middle East um, we worked wow. on the Olympic Games and we worked on a number of sort of design and build projects where we kind of provided services. So things changed in 2008. We're sort of now um, with COVID, we're actually, it's sort of gone the other way and we're doing a lot right. of small, small scale stuff. Um, so we're doing a lot of, uh, you know, instead of doing the big, big scale leisure stuff, we're doing a lot more, you know, residential projects, basements, um, house alterations. So, you know, you sort of have to be agile and, and change depending on the on the circumstances. Um, yeah. So that's where we're at at the moment. Makes sense, yeah. And the copper box you were involved in, weren't you, in the uh, 2012 Olympics? Yeah, yeah. So uh, on the 2012 Olympics, I did the copper box um, and I worked on Woolwich, which was a, a shooting range, the, the, the enclosure. So I designed, or I, well, I was helping the Olympic Delivery Authority checking that they were building all the um, venues correctly. Um, yeah. So yeah, the shooting range was the other venue I was involved in. Yeah. Great. So you, 
range of different sizes and and um you mentioned sort of quite a lot of leisurely stuff but also a bit of a bit of domestic and they do some um commercial offices and things like that as well yeah are there any sort of um philosophies that or, or, or sort of um ideals that you kind of work towards in terms of the, you know that, that bring together all of your designs or do you deal with every project as a kind of very much a standalone thing yeah so we have a um we sort of have a set of principles that underpin what we do um, and, and I call it my specs principles. So that's um, simplicity, precision, efficiency, a collaboration, and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So those principles sort of underpin every project. Um, and um, so if we just sort of pick one of those, say collaboration, um, we, um, we're very big on, on collaborating with uh, the contractor very early. Um, and actually, I think we should probably be also collaborating with facilities managers much earlier as well um, and thinking about what happens to the building once it's built and how it's managed. I think that's something that architects generally kind of aren't good at and, yeah. um, and, and we should be much better at. But, but in particular, um, collaboration means working with, collabor uh, you know, with contractors and consultants. And, and, and I think the, one of the big roles that architects do, which isn't very well understood, is that they coordinate. Mm -hmm. so they, they kind of pull together information from a variety of sources. And, 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 and um, so when an architect produces a plan, that plan has to sort of be able, you know, everything has to sort of fit into that plan. Yeah. You know, all the duct work, all the plant, all the, you know, everything has to work and be coordinated. So that's kind of, um, so that's collaboration. That'd be one example um, of the principle. Um, the other example would be sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, so we could talk about that just briefly. Um, mm -hmm. So in New Zealand, I did a master's in sustainability. So I, I did some research and I traveled the world um, in about 2000, looking at, looking at the most sort of um, cutting edge sustainable projects and um, did a master's on that. So uh, in terms of say how a building functions from, um, you know, like from a ventilation point of view, from an energy point of view, um, from a reuse point of view, we're, we're sort of quite um, we're quite sort of passionate about getting that right. Mm. I saw that um, down in Exeter, I think it is. There's going to be the first uh, leisure centre built. Is it um, is it Passive House Principles or yeah. something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's um, I mean that's that's a really good way of designing the building. Um, we um, we we've we've done passive house but it's it's not but we we usually use specialists to help us with passive house mm -hmm. so i don't do passive house myself but i'll bring people in to do passive house yeah. um i um we the, the only the only thing um passive house is good I, I think the only kind of downside is you you know it's a sealed building and it uses a machine to sort of circulate all the air so it's very efficient. Um, it's a very good way of design, mm. but um, you know the downside is you're you've got a you know you're you're using a machine to sort of control the temperature and recycle the air. But it is very efficient and very good. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Is there anything around that um, in in the sort of COVID perspective? Because obviously ventilation is now the big thing, yeah. isn't it? Is, is that um, comp compatible with passive house building? Well, I think um, I think it is. I think I think. Uh, ventilation is, is going to be massive now. Um, you know, be, I, th I think the days of sort of old, you know, old office buildings with you know poor ventilation systems, mm. no one's going to want want to use them. So, I think what's going to happen now is that there's going to be fewer. There's going to be probably um, less demand for offices, but the offices that they people want to use are going to have to be much better quality. Yeah, and, and particularly ventilation. So, you know, if you've got a massive floor plate. And you can't open the windows and you're in central london you've got to have a really people are going to want to see certification of the um you know of, of the regime for cleaning the filters and, mm. and making sure that the, the whole system's kind of up to up to scratch so yeah, yeah i think i think i think um i think covid uh, is going to change the way people sort of interrogate their workspace for sure mm. yeah lots of hotels are the same aren't they you don't you know windows don't open and you can just yeah pressure on people, uh, people on operators to, uh, yeah, to, I guess, to sort of show or, you know, prove what, what sort of ventilation they've got. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be interesting, interesting times. 
Um, well, COVID, COVID's obviously one aspect of safety when it comes to, to building design, and, and clearly that's been a big uh, shift that none of us are expecting in the last kind of 18 months. But uh, when it comes to, to safety in, in design, you know, what sort of trends have you seen over the last uh, couple of decades um, as you've been building your business, you know, is, is it, uh, have certain uh, aspects of safety become more or less important or what's the yeah, sort of overall yeah. overall view in terms of safety? Yeah, I think um, it, it's much more, it's much more in the for, forefront of people's minds now. Um, and I think, so just as an example, we, we, Put a lot of basements under houses, and mm. um, I mean that's 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 huge from a safety point of view. And um, it's not just the sort of it's also you know it's the temporary works. It's making sure the temporary works are safe. It's making sure the um, the installation safety excavation mm. um, and the contractors are, are much more kind of on the ball now than what they ever were. Um, we find that you know that that some contract in some parts of London you've got to have special certification to work. You know, say in the Grosvenor Estate, you you know you're going to have to um, have a specialist health and safety people, and you're going to have to prove that you can, you know, you you, you can actually build it safely. Hmm. Um, but we're finding most contractors doing those sorts of high risk activities are, are much better organised and and much better prepared than they used to be. Um, and and I think you know the fact that you have to do a sort of you know the whole pre construction health and safety um, regime and the risk assessments there. Um, you know, everyone's doing them much earlier, and um, so it's a mu it's much more um, present in, in people's minds than it used to be. Mm, yeah, more more rigorous um, processes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, just in my little niche of, of slips, I remember I've been doing this for about 10, 11 years, and uh, when I started, um, you know, talking to to architects and doing lunch and learns and things like that, and the knowledge about the the slip resistance uh, standards was a lot lower then yeah. than it is now. So that's, you know, to me, a, a good sign that people, um, you know, the awareness of, of that area has increased a lot over time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think everyone's sort of much more aware. And I think, um, you know, and, and I, think the, I think the world's more litigious than it used to be as well. I mean, I think there's two things, really. One is no one wants anyone to have an accident in their building. Mm. You know, so no one wants to have accidents while it's being built, and no one wants to have accidents after it's built. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and then secondly, no one, you know, no one wants to be sued either. Um, so there's sort of like, uh, you know, I think, um, so we're all sort of uh, much more worried about it and, and much more concerned about it and much more onto it than we used to be. Mm. Um, that's for sure yeah have there been any examples of any practices getting sued for health and safety related things that you're aware of or? yeah no not that I, not that i'm aware of but i'm sure they have been yeah, mm. i'm sure they have been but um but no i know that um you know the one that the one the 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 the, the uh the main the main thing i think is um sort of to prepare and for it in advance yeah. you know so to sort of get all your risk assessments done do your um do your pre-construction early um and you know and we 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 sort of use consultants to help us with that on on big on bigger projects i think it's the smallest scale projects which are more risky hmm. so you know on the bigger scale projects say if you're building a big leisure center you're going to have a consultant to help you with it um because it's a big complex thing but it's the smaller scale kind of more residential scale where actually i think it's quite risky because yeah. the builders are less, you know, the builders aren't quite as organised and, um, you know, you haven't got a consultant necessarily. So I think that's that's a, that's the bigger risk. I, I think on the bigger projects, it's like probably ironically less risky, mm. even though there's bigger stuff getting kind of craned in. Um, yeah. There's more controls and more and more awareness. I guess more, yeah, more eyes as well from, you know, yeah. from, from the clients who... who, who have more knowledge and about safety, you know, um, as well, I guess. I mean, exactly. I, we, no, we no, it's, exactly. It's the professional clients um, that, that sort of are, are, are actually really onto it. It's, it's the residential clients that know nothing about it um, and don't want to, and, and often don't want to pay, you know, for sort of health and safety. That's where the risk is. Yeah. 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 yeah we, we did a big uh, building project. Um, so I'm sitting in what was fresh air uh, four years ago. Okay. Um, we yeah. did a big sort of side extension and various other things and yeah I mean it is a minefield we we were we were lucky you know our, our architect who was recommended by um 
my cousin who's yeah. a uh, who's in the construction industry you know he, he did a good job for us and I mean it was um as these projects often are it was uh, not on time and not on budget but um yeah we got it we got that in the head yeah yeah good on you, good on you. <laughs> somehow some way yeah um so you've mentioned there about uh relying on, on on consultants and clients and and i guess as well um i mean something that i notice a lot is there's a lot of raft of kind of cpds available nowadays it seems to be a cpd for everything under the sun so i guess there's a lot of information from a sort of safety perspective coming from yeah. suppliers as well yeah yeah there is and we and we do rely on we do rely on suppliers a lot you know because architects architecture being you know the architect has to think of everything mm -hmm. um, and you know so you've got to you know while you're sort of thinking of structure and 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 &E and e and design and layout and planning and um you know contracts you're also got to think about health and safety and and everything else and i think we rely on a lot of expertise to sort of help us through this and i think that's where that, that's where it's um you know if the suppliers aren't supplying the right level of information architects can get into trouble so i think um you know we are we do rely heavily on 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 experts like yourself and suppliers of products and um you know a, a lot of people to help us make sure we get it right I mean, I think the architect's job, you know, and this is the sort of coordination bit again, but the architect's job is to write the right, to ask the right questions of the right people at the right time. Yeah. So, you know, to sort of make sure that when you're kind of um, putting a tender package together, you've got all that information in the tender package, you know, um, so that the, if it, say, if it goes to a design and build contract, mm -hmm. it's all built into the design before it gets sort of handed over from the client to the contractor. Yeah. So, you know, it's got to be in there early. Everything's mm -hmm. got to be in there early at the beginning. So you can't sort of come up, can't, you can't sort of start thinking, you know, after planning, you know, at the, at, you know, once it's got through planning and it's got its planning, you can't start thinking, how am I going to access that roof or how am I going to replace that panel or how am I going to get up there or how am I going to clean that? How, you know, it, it, it just it just doesn't work. So you've got to, you've got to be right on it early. And that's probably where the facilities management people have a role as well and advising you know yeah um, that kind yeah of hmm. how, do, how does it feel to you know because it's it's like such a big amount of work and such a huge amount of thought and preparation and planning and and so on so like you go through that whole process which probably takes years in, in many cases and then how does it feel to walk into one of these buildings that basically you've you know you you've drawn up in your mind and then on paper and and it's now yeah. in, in the real world. That must be a really amazing. Yeah, thing. well, it can it can it can feel you know it can feel pretty good if it's if it's um if it if it's all sort of uh absolutely bang on and yeah. everything's built precisely and you know and, and everything's gone well. It can feel pretty good, you know, um, walking into a big new space. Um, uh, it's exhausting. It's mm. a pretty exhausting process, but but it is kind of exhilarating if it works. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Do you sort of go in and, and find this, you know, do you sort of look at it as, wow, this is amazing, or do you really like hone in on the, any sort of small little things that you see that are, that are not quite right or not quite yeah, as Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's the sort of, uh, that, that's how it is, being an architect, you kind of notice all the defects before anybody yeah. else does. But most people wouldn't notice them, but you're no. sort of going, oh, my God, how did that happen, you know? Yeah. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen too much, but... No. Um, but no, I think sometimes you've got to just see the big bigger picture and 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 just enjoy the enjoy the result because you mm. know putting the, you know designing and building a building is a big deal and um and it's uh it's quite an exhilarating thing when it when it's mm. you know when it's uh when it comes off when you pull off something really good. Yeah, I suppose particularly on the bigger end of things where you know yeah of course it's great for say my family to have this beautiful you know bigger space to to live in and whatever. But I suppose if you build if you're doing something like the, the roundhouse theatre or the cough box or the serpentine or whatever you know it's kind of that's yeah. going to be there for the generate potentially generations as well so there's a huge um responsibility i guess on you yeah no absolutely absolutely i mean i think you know every time i walk into that little pavilion in Hyde park and you sort of walk into the main space and you look out over the water it feels pretty good you know it's mm. um but you know the setting the setting's pretty amazing there as well you know yeah. in, in the middle of Hyde park but um, you know, even the Roundhouse Theatre, I mean, you know, we renovated that um, 
uh, and a lot of the work we did was sort of invisible almost, you know, on, on the roundhouse because it was a grade two listed building. A lot of the work you can't even see. Yeah. But, but that that space, um, that main performance space with all that sort of, you know, cast iron and wrought iron structures, amazing. And it's been, you know, it still amazes me when I go in there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so buildings, you know, they last a long time and, um, and, and the legacy, the legacy of a good buildings, you know, it, like it, it, it's a, it, it can be, it can be there for a hundred, two hundred years. Mm. I was driving past um, Chelsea Barracks. We we're about to do some work at Chelsea Barracks. Um, nothing to do with me driving past, but I was just driving past it the other day. And uh, I used to live near Battersea Park, and I remember the furore when Prince Charles sort of put his foot down and said, "Oh, you know, really put up a fuss about these big glass." buildings they were planning to build there and they, they've now got something that is a bit more uh, sympathetic shall we say with the Royal Hospital across the road and, and stuff yeah. um, just out of interest you know what's your view on the sort of modernist glass structures versus the more classical um, building uh, design? Yeah well I, I'm um, so I have to sort of uh, admit that I'm, I'm a bit biased towards modern architecture mm -hmm. um, I have a I, 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 I sort of think that um, uh, I it did, but it does depend a little bit on the context. So if you were um, so if you were designing a building in in, in, the, in the in the middle of central London and it's an historic context, you've got to be quite um, sensitive to 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 what we're you building. Hmm. Um, so sometimes it can you know sometimes uh, it can really work. So the Lloyd's building, yep. which is you know by Richard Rogers, I mean that's a now a great. I, I think it's a great two listed building. You know, that's a, a, a classic of its era. Um, now, I would say that's a good building. It's an interesting building. But but not everybody has the skill to mm. pull off a building of that quality. So not every architect, you, you know, he's one of the, he would be one of the top architects of his generation. Not everyone's got the, those skills. So mm. in the hands of a, in the hands of a less skilled practitioner, probably you wouldn't want them to do something like that. Yeah. Um, and a contextual approach is safer. Um, so, you know, I think occasionally a one-off, you know, sort of tour de force, you know, um, building can it can work. But um, but uh, yeah, I think but I think generally most architects need to be really sensitive to the context and, um, and and kind of make sure that they don't design something that looks like an you know looks like a looks like a spaceship's landed you know yeah. in the middle of the city you know yeah i've seen a few of those around where i live um sort of uh, yeah very interesting um uh, extensions and things using strange materials and, yeah. and and so on but um i can appreciate the uh the skill of design of designing it um, for sure, although they do look yeah. a little bit like a spaceship's come down from. Yeah, well, I think you know, I think the Lloyd's building's a little bit of a. Um, that's an unusual building, and that's a very um, unusual piece of design. But a very skilled designer, not not many people can pull it off. Um, and and a lot of people probably wouldn't agree with me anyway. A lot of people that probably think the building's terrible. But um, it, but you know, it, it adds a lot of interest to the city for me. And um, you know, so I think. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other examples. The Channel 4 headquarters is another kind of interesting building. But, you know, a lot of buildings, you know, I think the city of London and parts of the city, you can kind of design modern buildings. So, you know, where the um, where all the skyscrapers are, there's a sort of a block of city, a block of buildings there where you can, you know, uh, they've probably got a bit far. They've probably mm -hmm. sort of overdone it, but um, you can get away with designing modern buildings there. Whereas in other parts of the city, I think you, you know, I think you've got to be super sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, so there, it, it, it sort of, I think from zone, I think from area to area within a city, you've got to be super sensitive about where you're designing. And there are parts where you've got a little bit more freedom and then there are other parts where you you just got to kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of suppress your ego is yeah. probably the word. Do some do some clever stuff inside rather than yeah. rather than on the outside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Make, makes sense. Yeah. Um, so something we, we were chatting about before we started, actually, um, was uh, sort of building lifespan, maintenance and, and, and things like that. So a uh, bit of context from from my perspective you know i've seen so many examples of you know beautiful new buildings um uh handed over with you know correctly specified floor tiles and then there's an o and m uh, manual um uh, given setting out how to clean the tiles and do this and that 
and it just sits on the shelf somewhere in in, a, in an office and never gets looked at. And then you you kind of rock up two or three months after the yeah. building's open and and the floor's disgusting because they've not been following the yeah. uh, the regime. And so uh, you were saying that you know this is this is a, not not a specific thing, but you know the point about it's got to be a living, breathing. Uh, thing that's uh, manageable and, and maintainable um, is something that's important to you. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think um, so. I think that the um, the ability to sort of uh, replace parts of the building and um, uh, well, well, first of all, uh, clean it and then replace it are, is 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 important. And I think um, you know, for example, the um, we designed the boathouse in Hyde Park. Is it just use that as an example? It's it's a modular building. All the cladding panels are the same. And if you want to replace one of the timber cladding panels, you take it. You, you can remove it. It's sort of removable. So you take that bit out and and you put it back in. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. I think um, I think that's got to be built into the training. I think what you're talking about is the training of the staff. Mm -hmm. So I think when you design a building, if you've designed a building to say um, be cleaned in a certain way or bits to be replaced in a certain way, you've got to train the people who are going to be looking after the building to do it. Mm -hmm. You can't just put it in a manual. Um, and, and leave it. So I think what should happen is um, on these buildings, if there's special ways of replacing things or cleaning things, you've got to have tr a training day mm. or a training week where you know everybody who's working in that building gets trained to do it. Now, um, you know, the people that now wouldn't be the architect training them all, it would be a number mm. of people, suppliers, it might be, you know, there could be all sorts of people training um the staff to you know, it's a bit like the m e system right you've got to mm. train people to use the m e system you've got to train people to um clean the floors you've got to train people how to just use the building in general and then i think what doesn't happen um is that the, it, after two years or even after a year or, or say two years there's no post-occupancy evaluation mm. you know so there's so architects actually just are terrible at doing post-occupancy evaluation so they never learn about their own mistakes so they never mm. learn what doesn't work so you should go back yeah. after a year um definitely after two years um at the at the at the outside and and check what's happening check how they're cleaning the building check what's working what's not working um and you know and if they have to replace timber on a, on a, on, a, on the outside of a building how are they doing it do they know how to do it do they know how to take that panel off um there has to be instructions and then there has to be training. I yeah. think that's kind of the answer. Mm. It's an interesting um, discussion point in the safety world, actually, around work as imagined versus work as done. And yeah. it's kind of the pa parallel there with what you're saying, which is, you know, you've imagined this, you've built this building and you've imagined the way it's going to be used and you've imagined the way that people will do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. But then actually just going in and checking, well, is that the way it's actually been done Yeah. Uh, since it's been opened? and yeah, it's interesting to hear that that maybe isn't as common as, as you might expect it to be. No, no, I mean, it's amazing that it's not, it's not as common as it should be, I think. Well, I think it comes down to sort of, um, might come right back to kind of when you talk to the client at the, at the briefing stage, you know, the, the briefing stage of the building is sort of what that critical stage where a lot of these things are talked about and need to be built into the whole sort of, you know the whole kind of thing so i think when you get the brief from the client and you or you write the brief for the client um mm. you actually talk about all these things so you yeah. talk about you talk about design you talk about procurement you talk about um you know you talk and then you talk about how the building is going to be managed and cleaned and operated at the afterwards i mean not i i, I can't I, you know a lot of people just wouldn't even get to that you know mm. <clears throat> yeah and I suppose the other complication is um, if, you know, if you're thinking of a, not so much a leisure centre, because those tend to be uh, built in in, in um, collaboration with the, the, the council, let's say, and then the operator that's going to build, uh, that's going to run the building, sorry. But thinking of a commercial office building or a museum or something like that, they'll often that kind of outsource the facilities management, won't they, to, to a CBRE or a JLL or something like that. And yeah. Those companies can change and just sort of bring whole, new systems in and, and that's where you can see a bit of a rupture of yeah of, 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 of those operating procedures as well i suppose yeah no totally totally um so yeah there's lots lots and lots of of uh of moving parts
Yeah, no, it's a complex. I mean, it's a complex sort of it's a complex environment, isn't it? Mm. Um, but the, but the more but the simpler you can kind of keep it, the more successful you're going to be. So that's, yes. where some, that's where simplicity comes in. Simplicity sort of has to run through the whole thing. Mm. Um, so you know, simplicity of design, getting 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 the, all the adjacencies right in a building, then simplicity of of um, fix, you know, of maintenance, simplicity of operation. I think simplicity as one of the principles has to be has to be a really good thing to kind of keep thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly if you're thinking about um, not just you know building a, something that's beautiful, but actually something that's functional and will last and will have that legacy and that impact over over years because you know you could create the most pristine thing you've ever built but if if, if people then can't stay on top of it it's not gonna it's gonna lose that luster isn't it and it won't perform yeah i mean we sort of you know we, like just as an example we renovated a um a cooking school recently and um they had this huge roof at the back of the cooking school um with a window looking over the roof and we had to get up on the roof to survey the building and it was two stories up a great big sort of um sort of flattish roof and you couldn't get onto the roof there was no access even though there was a window there there was no access onto the roof you had to we had to build a scaffold um at the back of the building to actually get up onto the roof and do a survey that's, wow. cr that's just crazy you know mm -hmm. so no one no one had ever thought about it no one had actually been on the roof for about three years I don't think. but um you know it's one of those things as soon as you need to get on the roof it, you know, you got to get up. It was two store. It was two big stories high. So, you know, I think these things. Um, you see these things all the time, don't you? Yeah, you'd be annoyed if you were uh, on one of the higher floors and dropped your house keys onto the roof, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be a killer, wouldn't it? You'd never get them back. Never ever get them back, or it cost you like ten grand of scaffolding yeah. or something to yeah to get them back. Yeah, that'd be a, a difficult one to explain to uh, to your better half when you go home. Exactly. <laughs> Try to avoid the calamities like that if we can help yeah. it. Um, so we talked a bit about um, sustainability earlier, um, and I, I assume that as well as this this kind of uh, greater emphasis on safety, um, sustainability and ESG is is probably a big trend um, that's that's you know front of mind and increasingly so uh, within your world. Um, what's your view on that and, and then are there any other sort of bigger trends that you that are, that are happening or you're, you're seeing kind of coming? Yeah. yeah, so that's interesting. So I think sustainability, um, clearly we talked about ventilation, which is a big one, natural ventilation, um, you know, we're, wherever possible, but we're not possible. Um, so if you're in a busy, noisy environment, you know, central London, for example, then um, or central Manchester or wherever it is, then then um, then you're going to need a good a good a good system that's really operational. So that's one thing. The second thing is the kind of materials you use um and um you know so where you source your materials from um how robust are the materials how easy they are to replace now that's kind of where it can with flooring and things that can get really tricky mm -hmm. um you know because um you know uh some of the robust the more robust materials are uh, the most environmentally friendly yeah. so vinyl flooring for example we, there was a lot of vinyl flooring used on the copper box um but uh, you know I, again now um companies are starting to make all these different products um in different ways so you know mdf you know you can get sort of you know you can get environmentally friendly mdf you can get so it, it, a lot of these products are coming onto the market now um so what you want is a robust product that lasts a long time it doesn't have to be ripped out after sort of three years but um, is, sustain is environmentally sustainable as well. And, and, and that's been difficult up from now. But I think we're getting there um, with the manufacture of products. So, you know, the kind of insulation you might use, you know, for example, um, uh, you know, we use warm cell insulation on the boathouse in Hyde Park. Um, that, you know, and that's really uh, sustainable. So I think, you know, uh, if whenever you can, you want to be you be uh, being really be really aware of what materials you use now in terms of say trends i think sort of um, um you know uh cross laminated timber and glue lamb timbers are getting used more and more and more i think the problems um well the fear has always been fire 
um, overcoming the fire issues. But look, you know, when you look at sort of um, what buildings have gone up in smoke recently, you know, um, and, and where the disasters have been, they haven't they haven't been in timber buildings. They've been in right. other kind, you know, other sort of buildings. So I think the Scandinavians use a lot of um, uh, manufactured, you know, highly manufactured timbers to build quite big buildings. And I think we're going to see more of it here, but it's just kind of getting everyone on board with the fire and making sure that the fire works. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm a big fan of cross laminated timber. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think we should be making more of it here. I think at the moment we're having to import a lot of it from Austria and, and places like that. But, but, you know, so the big trends are the big trend is also um off-site manufacture mm -hmm. so you know it, it's never going to be fully i don't think we're ever going to be fully off-site you know i think there's going to be more off-site but i think it's always going to be a mix um of on-site and off-site so i think okay. unless you're mcdonald's and then you build the whole thing and just plonk it down on a yeah. lorry somewhere <laughs> yeah i mean i think some you know i think the japanese have kind of been got really good at building sort of modular houses and i think a lot of houses are modular because they sort of like if they if they just sort of get dropped onto a plot and and it's fairly it's fairly uh flat it's fairly it's fairly easy hmm. but i think you know a lot of we're still gonna um have a mix between you know old technology and sort of new kind of um you know modern technologies and i think we're going to have to sort of figure out how to make make it all work together um but you know say uh there's a lot more manufacturing going on now than there used to be um, yeah. so there's a lot more panels getting manufactured and i think that's a good thing mm -hmm. um the more off-site the better because the more off-site it, it, then it's in more controlled conditions isn't it so if yeah. you build something in a factory and you can put it on a truck you've got to transport it but um you know you're out of the rain you're in controlled conditions you can build it and then if you can assemble that on site i mean you know we've been building like that for a long time um mm. you know even roof trusses and things like that have been built like that forever um so it's not it's not a lot of that's not new technology but i think the more we do it the safer the safer uh sites will be um it's just um but I think the dream of having you really manufactured off-site isn't 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 a reality. I think you're always going to have a mix. Yeah, I remember um, seeing quite a few examples of, of off-site manufacture in like grand designs where they, you know, they they come on site and they're like hoping that this is all going to fit. Uh, yeah. And when it does, they were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's right. I think. Um, I mean, you've got you know offsite manufacture. That's where precision comes in. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, in the in the principles, the specs principles, precision is absolutely. I mean, precision is important anyway, but particularly if you're building stuff offsite and you're putting your manufacturing it, and then it's got to all fit together. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, fire, and obviously, um, I, I hadn't thought of asking about this, but it's come to my mind, so I will. Um, We've obviously we've obviously living through this whole kind of Grenfell cladding um, issue at the moment. I mean, to, to what extent is that something that architects were aware of, and you know, it, it, is that something where people should have been doing a bit better, or does that come back to what you said earlier, yeah. where you, you're relying on the on the suppliers and, and perhaps you've been let down a bit by by the supply chain somewhere? Yeah, I think um, I think in the past we relied a lot on on fire engineers for big for bigger buildings and um they um uh, in the fire engineering solutions kind of were um the, the 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 london fire brigade kind of were a little bit easier on on sort of alternative solutions and and in you know fire engineering solutions i was involved in a project um about 18 months ago where it had been designed sort of originally four years ago and then they started building it and then Grenfell Tower happened mm. and the London Fire Brigade sort of um, actually stepped in and 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 refused uh, and in turn you know refused the application to have right. the have all the fire you know for the fire design mm. and they were half you know they were part way through construction so we had to come in and we had to redesign the apartments and it wasn't our project we hadn't designed the project we just got brought in to sort of troubleshooters mm. we had to redesign the project um so that um they had a, a distance i think it was 7.5 meters from the front the front door of each apartment to the core 
the safe the safe core. Um, so we had to do a lot of redesign work because um, the contractor was faced with putting sprinklers right through the building mm. at a cost of fortune. So I think yeah. I think what's happened is that the London Fire Brigade and and and, and building control have got much tougher since and since Greenfall when they aren't allowing sort of you know alternative sort of um fire solutions like they might have done in the past hmm. um and of course the cladding's a massive issue now you know you can um, yeah. you can't you know the, the cladding's a huge issue so um cladding's one thing but just just the design of the building you know the fire design of the building itself is um you know it's very tough now even you know even if you um even we're finding on residential stuff um if you put in a loft you know um you know if, you know on the fourth you know, if it ends up being the fourth floor um so you've got ground one two three and four mm. you know you're you're into you're into a fire spring you know you're into sort of having yeah. sprinklers in yeah we've um, had that on our road where people have um uh i think well, our road is Victorian, so it's it would be the loft in the third floor. But I think we're having they're having to either uh, box in the staircase to produce like a safe passage or put sprinklers throughout the house. Yeah, yeah. Well, you need a you need a safe pa but you need a safe passage. Plus, in some cases, you need sprinklers as well. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like uh, you know. So even residential stuff, it's got tougher. So um, yeah, it's quite a big issue. Mm. Uh, fires, are, fires are massive now. I mean, should have always been. I mean, you know, I think um, I think we sort of come. If you if you think about the uh, the golden thread of quality uh, or the golden thread, you know, Jane, Dame Judith Hackett talks about mm. the golden thread, but the golden thread is actually really um, in the old days. You would have had a clerk of works on site, and that clerk of works would have been trained, you know, on site. For years and they would have known exactly when you know, you know where the fire barriers have to go and how to get fixed into the building and mm. what you know and and we just don't have people like that anymore i mean it's mm. uh, it's crazy you know like like training someone to actually go on site work out what's been built figure out what's been done wrong it's a big job to train someone to get up to that level and yeah. um, you know in the old days we had the clerk of works that did it who, and they, a lot of them did a really great job and, and we just don't have them anymore and, and actually it's a real problem yeah yeah so yeah so lots of progress but then an example of regression yeah. um at the same yeah. time yeah yeah, yeah. Totally. Totally. interesting interesting well graham um i really appreciate you sharing your time it's been very very interesting um where can people go to learn more about you uh see some of the stuff you've been involved in um, social media or articles or videos or yeah, whatever, so, um, whatever you've got yeah so if they if people go to grahamfordarchitects.com so um that's my website grahamfordarchitects.com and um, you can also find me on linkedin graham ford um graham ford architects look me up on linkedin and um, connect with me um, and have a look at the website and go to uh, there's some free resources on there and there's a scorecard now we've got a scorecard for residential um, and that's like a sort of a benchmarking tool that people can use to sort of find out what they need, you know, what they need help with. So we've got one for residential and we're building one at the moment for, for leisure, uh, sports and leisure as well. Not quite ready yet, but uh, have a look at the one for the residential. Um, and, uh, and there's some free resources on there. So download any, any, any free resources that you think might be helpful. Fantastic. Yeah, big fan of scorecards, as you know, I've got, got one myself. So. Uh... They're always good fun. So yeah, yeah, we'll encourage people to check that out. Great. Well, Graham, uh, thank you very much for your time. And, and thanks everybody for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did um, and we've earned it, please give us a five-star review. Please hit subscribe and please let any friends or colleagues know uh, about the show that you think would, uh, would benefit from it. So thanks a lot, Graham. Thank you. And thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Cheers. Bye.